Sure. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the um, South Atlantic Board. I'm Lynn Fagley, representing the state of Maryland and currently serving as your chair. Uh, it The sun has come out. It is turning into a beautiful afternoon in our little section of the Mid-Atlantic. Um, I hope the same for all of you. And I really do look forward to the day when we can do this again in person. We have a big agenda today um, and the staff have been really nice to provide an agenda in our materials that has times associated with it. And I'm gonna try really hard to stick with those. And the marquee event is of course the finalization of addendum one to amendment one for Atlantic Cobia. Um, so with that, I'll dig in and the first order of business is to approve the agenda. Is there anyone who, uh, has any changes or modifications um, to the agenda? I see no hands. Okay, seeing none, I'll move on uh, to the approval of the proceedings which are in your packets. They are the proceedings from our August 2020 meeting. Does anyone have any changes or modifications uh, proposed for those proceedings? I don't see any hands. Perfect. Okay. Seeing none, the next piece on our agenda is um, public comment. Tony, do we have anybody signed up to speak? Well, there is no sign up to speak. We just, um, you would just ask to see if anybody wants to comment on anything that is not on the agenda and on staff that people raise their hand. Yep. Okay, so I will ask that question if there's anybody who wants to comment and I just will remind everyone I know we're finalizing an addendum today and we had hearings um, on those agendas. So that was the opportunity for comment. So if you have um, something to share with the board that is not on the agenda, um, please raise your hand. Lynn, you have Dewey Hemelwright. Um, okay, uh, Dewey, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Lynn, and, and also thank you for opportunity to comment. Um, uh, with the cobia is a bycatch fishery, and it would be good if we could turn regulatory discards into landings. Uh, as the abundance of this fish is increasing, um, I would think that one thing that needs to be done is to look at when you're landing of the cobia fish. Right now, there's only in pounds. There is no way, uh, it's my belief that states do not record how many fish are landed. And given that you have a landing limit that's put in the number of fish, it would be good if we could also see probably for future stock assessments, that each state that have uh, commercial landings of cobia be put in uh, the amount of fish that's landed. And so that's kind of my comments uh, sticking to the parameters of uh, allowed comments. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hemory. I appreciate that. Um, is there anybody else with public comment? don't see any other hands raised, Lynn. Okay, so with that, uh, the next agenda item is to get right into uh, addendum one. And with that, uh, Tony, I'll kick it over to you for uh, to take us through it. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Maya, if you will take us, yep, perfect. And if you'll go to the next slide, please, Maya. Um, so, the board took addendum one uh, out for public comment, and we had four hearings. Some of those were joint hearings amongst the states. These hearings were all held via webinar, and we had about 25 folks that were in attendance at the different hearings. I'm sorry, that's a very loud helicopter outside of my house. I apologize. As if it were landing on my house. Um, okay. Uh, and um, we 
we had uh, nine comments come in from as uh, letters. Seven of those were from individuals, majority of those being commercial fishermen, and two were from groups, ASA and the BSSA, and both of those groups are uh, recreational fishermen. So I will get directly into the issues. Next up slide, Maya. Um, so this addendum is looking at several factors for cobia management. The first issue is looking at allocation and the decision of how to split the allocation between the, the allocation of the quota between the commercial and the recreational fishery. There were four options that went out for comment that varied from status quo, which is the 92% recre recreational, 8% commercial. Um, a second option was 97-3. Third option is a 96-4% split. And the last option being the 95-5% um, split. Um, option B is the option that if you were to have um, put the new MREP data into the quota allocation, is roughly what the um, allocation lines up to be between the commercial and the recreational fishery. And then options C and D are um, options that fall within the range of landings that have occurred over the last 10 years. Next slide, Maya. Um, this table indicates the support that we received either through the hearings or through the written comments. Um, the majority of the <clears throat> comments that we received were for status quo, um, and then there was some additional com um, support for the 97.3% and one support for the 96.4%. Um, in the in particular, in the hearings and, and in some of the written comments, uh, we had individuals that spoke strongly in favor of status quo because the commercial fishery had been closed several times in the past few years and that they hadn't had the opportunity to try and harvest the total 8% of the quota at an increased quota. They indicated that de minimis landings would only be increasing as we see Kobe expand its range. And since the de minimis states are included in the overall quota, the new quota should be able to accommodate this growing fishery. Uh, commenters indicated that the cobia fishery is mainly a bycatch fishery and should be open year round due to consumer demand, the high price per pound, and the year round um, participation. So, um, in, a, in addition, um, people felt that revisiting a change in allocation in a few years once the commercial fisheries had a chance to try and catch their full quota maybe something that could be looked at. Um, one participant brought up that when quota gets taken away from the commercial industry, that um, the consumer also loses, that COBIA is considered a public trust resource and to cut their resource and deprive the public of those who may not be able to afford to go out and catch their own COBIA um, shouldn't happen. Uh, those commenters that were in favor of the status quo um, wanted to see the fishery, or not status quo, the option B, 97.3%, wanted to see the recreational fishery to be able to allow their full harvest, that this is what the data is showing the split should be under the allocation method with the updated data. Um, and in the dis next slide, please, Maya. In the discussions that we had during some of the public hearings, there were questions from the public about discard data and, you know, that the commercial fishery isn't always able to fully harvest because they have to discard their catch. Um, we do have very limited discard information out there in the commercial fishery. Virginia does have some observer data. Um, and so this data here is their the information that they have. Um, it goes back to 2016. There are a limited number of trips, as you can see, um, and all of the discards in these trips were because of the fish was under its size limit. Next slide, Maya. 
The next issue is the commercial trigger. Um, as you recall, we had previously established a commercial trigger method, um, and this trigger tells us when we need to close the commercial fishery, when we're starting to get close to the quota. It was a formula that was developed, and when we um, got the new estimates from the updated stock assessment, the quota was really high. And when we tried to apply the trigger formula to a really high quota, the TC found that it didn't work. Um, and they also actually found that if the quota had been really low, the trigger method wouldn't work in that case as well. So they developed a new method and are recommending that the board move to this new method so that we are able to close the fishery um, when we're getting close to the quota. And this is just to um, remind everybody is that because some of the states um, need a little additional time to close their fishery, um, you can't just close immediately 48 hours after you hit a trigger. Um, it's the reason why we are looking for a longer period of time of advance notice than in normal fisheries. So it's giving you a 30 day warning to give the states that need an administrative um, time frame, a longer administrative time frame to actually get their process through and then close the fishery. Next slide, please. Um, so there was a few folks that were in favor of status quo, um, not changing the trigger. And there were about four folks that were in favor of um, making change to the trigger. Not a lot of rationale behind folks' um, support for that. The next issue is looking at commercial de minimis measures. And um, next, that's the next slide there, Maya. Sorry, I forgot to tell you that. Um, there are six options here to look at changes in the commercial de minimis measures. And this is looking at how many, um, how much of the commercial quota should be set aside for the de minimis states and all of the states are currently de minimis um, on the board except for South Carolina, Virginia, and North Carolina. So the first option is status quo um, is to set aside 3% of the quota. The option B is to set aside 3% but limit it to 3,000 pounds. The third option is setting aside at 3%, but limiting to 5,000 pounds. Next slide, Maya, uh, is uh, option D. Is the fourth option is setting aside 4% of the quota. Option E is setting aside 4%, but capping it at 3,000 pounds. And option F is setting aside 4% of the quota and capping it at 5,000 pounds. Next slide, Maya. And this is just a reminder to the board, under the different quota scenario options, how much uh, the quota would actually be set aside for each of the quota options here. You can just see those values of what they're associated with. Under the 3% option, the most that can be set aside is just over 4,000 pounds. And the smallest amount is just over um, 1,500 pounds. And under the 4% scenario, the highest would be almost 6,000 pounds, and the lowest is um, just about uh, 2,200 pounds. Next slide, Maya. So the public comment here was quite mixed. Um, there was very limited comment that we received. Um, the only thing in terms of the verbal comments that we received on this is that you know that the fishery was expanding um, amongst states and that there should be room to allow for these states to um, to grow into a fishery. Um, we see that there was support for our option B, C, E, and F. Um, and just as a reminder, 
uh, as we have seen the expansion of this fishery, we have started to see a lot of variability in the landings of the de minimis states. So one year we'll have high landings, the next year we'll have lower landings. Um, and it's quite all over the place. And so there's not a lot of pattern to what those states landings are over time. And the last issue is uh, the recreational de minimis measures. And these have to do with the minimum sizes associated with the de minimis measures. And this issue came about from information coming out of the last stock assessment, the CDAR 58, looking at uh, at what size are fish sexually mature. Uh, the option A is status quo. It's a 29 fourth length or 33 inches. Option B is 31 inches fourth length and 35 inches total length. And it's estimated that roughly 60% of the female would be mature at um, that size limit. And the status quo, it, it's roughly 33% of the female are mature at 29 inches. And then lastly, for option C, it's a 33 inch um, fourth length, total length 37 inches and roughly 100% um, of the female would be mature at this size limit. And this um, also matches the um, commercial size limit as well. In terms of the um, comments that we received for this, all of the comments that we did receive were in support of the um, option C, 100% female are mature at this size limit and folks felt like this was um, allowed for these fish to spawn at least once um, to be able to produce um, young to add to the spawning stock biomass at least one time. It's important for the growth and health of the fishery. An additional comment that we did receive that isn't directly related to any of the options, but um, somewhat related to size limits, is that there is a growing concern amongst recreational anglers about um, the spawning stock of cobia, and they wonder if the measures um, to allow for better protection of larger fish and more harvest of smaller fish would be an appropriate measure. So maybe looking at a slot, perhaps over the years, recreational anglers have seen a decline in the bigger fish, and they don't want to see an overall decline in the stock. And they just didn't know if that was because the size limits have increased and increased over time. Um, so, Madam Chair, that's all of the information that I have in terms of the summary of the public comment that we received. Once we're done going through the addendum, I do want to come back and discuss the next steps that we need to take in terms of setting measures for next year. Okay, great, and thank you. And I just want to take a quick moment for um, anyone who's listening from the public who attended and participated in the public hearings. Uh, the turnout was a little bit low, and we really appreciate those who participate and weigh in, and, and public comment is very important to the deliberations of the board. So um, thank you, and um, keep, keep it up. We appreciate it. So with that, um, do, are there any questions for Tony on the presentation? Don't see any hands raised, Lynn. Okay. Well, with that, then let's um, let's go to and maybe uh, by what we can do is go to the slide that uh, outlines issue number one. Oh, yep. Yeah, issue number one, so we can see it, and then we'll uh, have at it. Perfect. All right. So, just is there anybody who wants to start off with discussion on issue number one, allocation? Let's make sure I have my hands sorting in the right spot. Okay, we have Mel Bell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Mel. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Just something point out that option A status quo, the, the status quo component of that 
are the percentages, um, you know, which which we've inherited. Um, but the but the way it works out after the after the adjustment for uh, MRIP, um, of course, the the landings or the uh, potential quota themselves is not status quo. Uh, option B is really probably closer to where the fishery was um, related to the uh, the commercial uh, component and the, the recreational piece. So it, I, I realize status quo that those are the percentages, and that's why we're calling that status quo. But um, that's that's um, you know, we're, and we're this is something we, of course we'll be dealing with with all sorts of fish stocks <laughs> over the next few years as we get into allocation discussions. But I just thought that's worth pointing out. Thank you, Mel. Yeah, that's that's a very um, apt comment, and just you know, for the edification of the board, I believe that the commercial quota has been set uh, for the last number of years at fifty thousand pounds as the coastwide commercial quota. Um, any other anybody else with discussion on this issue? And then at some point, we'll be looking for a motion. We have Bill Gorham and then Pat Gear. Bill Gorham, go ahead. So, thank you. I just wanted to double check the at the fifty thousand pound mark. Didn't that um, wasn't there some overages um, that led to closures? Yes, and Tony, I don't. If you want to provide more detail on that, but that is definitely true. There were closures. Um, I don't have all of them at my fingertips listed, but when the Atlantic Council's management. Tony, you're to, difficult to hear right now. You're chopping in and out. Bill, if you can mute yourself while I'm talking and then you can unmute yourself to respond, that'd be perfect. Thank you. Is that better, Tina? Yes. Thanks. Um, Prior to the relinquishing of the FMP to the commission from the South Atlantic Council, the fishery did close several times under the 50,000 pound limit. Um, and then that 50,000 pound limit carried over to the commission's FMP. Um, last year, we did not have to close the fishery though. Um, and I need to double Previous year. You also clipped out part of your last segment, Tony. Said I need to double check what happened the previous year. Bill, is there okay. another? Yeah. I was, um, I think Mel is referencing the going back to 2000, 2008, when they came up with this split of eight and 92, um, and kind of using, applying the new estimate um, surveys and applying that effort um, through that time series. And uh, to me, it, as someone who recreational fishes, um, or at least North Carolina, I just kind of feel like that, that would kind of be like rewriting history as far as the participation in the fishery as compared to now. Um, just thinking to make that point, I'm just not sure if that would really is appropriate to apply um, as far as North Carolina's fishery because the participation is more recently is uh, tenfold more than that 2000 to 2008 period. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, Bill. And Pat Gear, I believe you were on deck. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to, uh, you know, agree with what Mel was saying. The status quo really isn't. It's this 146,000 pounds was the result of the Emirate calibrations and the new stock assessment. Nobody on the board when we met in February thought that number was reasonable. They didn't think that was it, it was an appropriate number, and that's why this addendum came about. So, um, you know, it, so really, it, you know, I agree with Mel. 
status quo would be option B. But if you look at the, the landings, the behavior of this fishery over the last five years, we are almost right in between B and C. We're, we're, you know, the, 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 the landings are, you know, are right in between those two numbers. So, you know, those two options seem to me to be the most reasonable. Thank you. Thank you, um, Pat. Appreciate that insight. Is there anybody else with um, comments on uh, this issue before we go to motions? Um, yes, Chris Bat Savage and Lynn. I apologize. Um, we did close last year and the two previous years, so we have had to close the fishery seventeen, eighteen, and nineteen. And. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that that's really good information. And and Tony, were, were those closures? Did those occur early in the year in the, in September, or were they before that? Do you know? I need to look that up. Um, why don't we like Chris? Oh, maybe Pat here. Yeah, he just he might be able to respond faster than me. Yeah. Um, I I believe they were about mid August. Um, they were um roughly. If I had to, I mean, they were about the same day each year. It's like. October 23rd or 24th, right in that area, because it was literally right before our commission meetings. So it was about mid-August is when they closed. Mid-August. Okay, great. Thanks, Pat. And um, Chris Pat Savage. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, hate to be just throwing dates around exactly when we closed, uh, and I'd have to go back and, and check our proclamations, but it seemed like it was early September that we got the notice from from NOAA Fisheries that uh, that the 50,000 pound quota was reached and, and we closed soon after in North Carolina. Other states closed a little later than that, um, you know, just due to their administrative processes. But, but Tony is absolutely right. It was 2017, 18, 19, and it was right about the same time each of those years. Thanks. Oh, thank you for that. Um, okay, anybody else on uh, issue one? We have um, Pat here and Marty Gary. Uh, okay, Pat here, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot. Um, I was just going to say, you know, the the feds when uh, the feds are managing it, they announced it mid mid um, August, and we closed it in Virginia on September 30th. Each of those years. Okay, that, I I think that's really helpful. Um, for the board to know. Uh, Marty Gary. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, no comments, but I'd be willing to offer up a motion whenever you're ready. I would say we're ready. Oh, okay. So, um, for the greater good, I'll go up and I'll offer a motion related to issue one, recreational commercial allocation. Move to approve option C. 96% recreational and 4% commercial allocation. And I'd be happy to comment on that if I get a second. Yeah, Joe Semino. I'm not sure if you heard me, Lynn, but it was Joe Semino as a seconder. Excellent. Seconded by Joe Semino. Um, Marty, do you want to um, comment on your motion before we go to discussion? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so PRC is not a big time player with this species, but as has already been mentioned multiple times, this fishery has been dynamic and changing and growing. Um, and as you'll hear probably a little bit later in the, in the meeting, um, you know, we've seen some fish uh, move into our area in the three and a half decades I've been working on Chesapeake Bay. Um, the last five years with this species have been very, very different than the first three decades where, you know, we hardly saw them in the mid bay where our lower part of our jurisdiction uh, comes to the confluence with Maryland and Virginia. Um, so very, very dynamic fishery. But the rationale behind the motion for uh, for C um, and, and Pat here, I think, really illustrated this pretty clearly. Um, I think the sweet spot somewhere there between B and C, but I'll, for the you know, for, for what it's worth, I'll my, my thoughts are you look at the last five years of the average coastwide commercial harvest, it's running about 64,000 and change. Um, and given the fisheries is is growing um, and the harvest in 2019 um, looks like it was around 65,000 uh, pounds. 
my thought is maybe go for option C. I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, going with B and that lower number. Uh, I'm just concerned that the way this fishery is trending, uh, that's going to put us in a bad position, um, you know, with, with the commercial entities and some of this change that's going on. Um, so I really think based on the way the trend is moving with the fishery, um, that that's the that's the better choice at this time. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll yield after that. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, any more discussion on this motion? We have Chris Fat Savage, Deb Haymans, Joe Semino, and Pat Gear. Okay, Chris Beth-Savage, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I think whatever allocation we pick, we ideally pick the one that provides enough fish for both the commercial and recreational fisheries, but yeah, that's not always an easy task. Um, I think in terms of the commercial fishery, it's, it's really important that whatever option we pick allows that fishery to remain open year-round because uh, landings are, are year-round and and they're largely incidental catch uh, while in fisheries targeting other species, especially in the fall. Um, and, and these Kobe catches are going to occur whether the season is open or closed. Uh, so it re results in, in discards occurring. Um, I looked at uh, North Carolina commercial landings in the fall from October to December in 2015 and 2016. Those are the two years right before we had those early closures in September. And they were they ranged from twenty five to twenty nine thousand pounds, and uh, I think as uh, was just stated earlier, uh, twenty nineteen landings were were over sixty thousand pounds, uh, even with the the early closure. Um, it, uh, th this option might be that sweet spot, or or maybe not. Um, you yeah, know, especially as uh, as these fish expand north into other fisheries. Uh, where they might be, where they may become incidental catch. Uh, so with that, I would like to offer a substitute motion uh, for, for issue one, the recreational and commercial allocation uh, move to approve option B, 95% uh, recreational and 4% commercial allocation. Okay, is there a second to that? Maya, that's option D is in David, and then it's 95 recreational, 5% commercial. And then, Doug Caymans, are you seconding it, or are you just wanting to speak? Uh, not no, but no. I had a, a, an alternative substitute I wanted to offer, so I don't know how many substitutes we can allow. But... We can go too deep, so you can do one more substitute if you'd like. Wait and see if Mr. Bassett has just a second. Pat here, okay. are you seconding? No, I am not. I still just have my hand up. No. So, Tony, we had, after Chris, we had Doug Haymans, Joe Semino, and Pat Gear on deck. So, I think what, what I would like to do is find a second to um, Chris's motion and then um, maybe work our way back around. I don't really want to miss what those three had to say. So, maybe we'll get a second and then, and then start through the, the waiting list. Currently, do not see any hands for seconding this motion. Okay, one, one more call. Any, any, anyone care to second the motion by Mr. Bat Savage for option D, as in dog? Okay, so in that case, we will um, return to the main, the main motion for option C, and what I'm going to do is go back to the list. So, uh, Doug Haymans, you are on deck. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, um, I really thought that we could just 
addendum to an amendment all was for recalculating based on MRIP. And for all the reasons that, that uh, Pat and Mel both articulated earlier, option B gets us closer to what the status quo was prior to the MREP recalculations. And I was truly hoping, based on all of our discussion back in February, that this board was, was moving towards what is now option B. So I would uh, offer a substitute motion to approve option B, please. Okay. Hey, Maya, before you get too far, um, I need you to bring that other motion that failed. If you could just write motion fails for lack of a second and then start your next substitute so we don't lose anything. In yeah, thank you, Tony. That's good. So this is B as in boy, uh, 97 percent recreational and three percent commercial allocation. And Mel Bell, are you seconding that? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you, Mel. And that was by Doug Heyman's Maya and the seconder is Mel Bell. Okay. So now we have a a uh, new um, substitute motion on the table. Um, I think what I would like to do um, is, um, I think what I'd like to do is complete the list of people waiting to speak for originally. So the next person that I, and then once we do that, um, Doug, I think you offered good rationale for your motion. Um, so let me go back. I had um, Joe Semino next on the list to speak uh, before these substitute motions. Joe, do you still um, want to address uh, what's on the board? Yes. Go for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, um, I, I appreciate Doug's comments. I, I, I'm against his substitute still for the main. Um, I'm representing the state of New Jersey, but spent a lot of time in Virginia when, um, you know, when all of the major issues were going on with explosive MREP estimates, um, you know, you drill down into those estimates, which we did in Virginia, we saw that they were talking about landing, the MREP estimates are saying that thousands of fish were landed um, just in in a weekend over Fourth uh, of July weekend seemed to be a huge problem for these enormous MRIP estimates in Virginia. Those estimates are driving these percentages. At the time, the recreational community said they were unbelievable. Um, that percentage, instead going to the commercial fishery, that 18,000 pounds to the commercial fishery instead of 1,000 fish to the recreational fishery, is huge in addressing what uh, Chris Bat Savage and, and Dewey Hemmelwright have brought up that a lot of the fishery that exists commercially for this species is incidental. We're seeing it more and more further north. And I think it's, I think it makes a hell of a lot of sense to, to allow those fish um, to actually be taken in the commercial fishery uh, than to, you know, play with the MRIP numbers here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, Pat Gear, you were on deck. Do you still want to um, speak to what's on the board? Uh, yeah, I'll change what I was going to say. I, I would just, you know, I appreciate the the substitute motion by Doug, but I would question whether or not, you know, 54,000 pounds is the new status quo. As Marty mentioned, you know, for the last five years, they've caught about 65,000 pounds. So that, that's what's being harvested. And so, and, and I'll go back to say, it's like, you know, it, I, the real number here is probably between option, you know, option B and option C, you know, but I think, you know, going with option B, you know, may be problematic because it, it, we're going to exceed that. We're going to exceed that. Um, you know, we have been exceeding that and that, that could be a problem. You know? Thank you. 
Thank you, Pat. Yeah, I think it is true that that issue of regulatory discards is one that we need to keep our eye on. Um, is there is there anybody else who now has um, comment to the substitute motion for option B? So, Lynn, you now have um, Roy Crabtree, Chris Hot Savage, Mel Bell, and Spud Woodward. Okay, um, Roy Crabtree. Yeah, I, just to point out that the commercial landings were about 53,000 in 2018 and 68,000 in 2017. So you know, it's quite likely that under option B that you would have closures. Um, also, I mean, it seems like the stock is healthy and that the biomass of cobia has, has increased. So it's, it's not just the FES survey, there's been some increase. So it doesn't seem unreasonable to me, at least, that quote, commercial quota could increase a little bit. Thank you. Great, thank you for that, Roy. I appreciate that, um, that insight on the stock assessment in particular. Um, Chris, that's Savage. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, I agree with the last few commenters. Uh, just to uh, add, add to that, um, you know, the uh, the new MRF estimates going into stock assessments for a lot of species have kind of changed our understanding of, of yeah who's catching what and how much can be taken from the population uh, with the things being rescaled, and it's gone different directions based on on other factors uh, going on with the, the stock that goes in the assessments. Um, and I think it might have might be taken from a different uh, uh, board meeting, but you know, kind of thinking about you know the commercial increases that have occurred uh, from these you know new updated assessments for other species where the, the quota goes up for the commercial fishery by quite a quite a bit, but you know, the recreational fishery stays status quo. I guess another way of looking at it is uh, you know, the recreational fishery was already kind of harvesting where they where they were in the past, the commercial fishery was really held artificially low, um, you know, due to our prior understanding of the stock with with quotas and whatnot. And I think that's exactly what we saw with with, with Cobia, you know, with these early closures. Um, so, you know, kind of a long winded way of saying that I support the uh, the underlying measurement. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, Melville. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, my my attraction to to option B, which is obviously the most conservative um, approach, is and, and I certainly don't deny that the the harvest for commercial harvest 17, 18, 19 it exceeded that, and we did have to shut the fishery down. But South Carolina, unfortunately, has some experience with cobia uh, in our history, and uh, just from our own experience, I guess I'm very sensitive to the fact that. Um, you know, we had we had a pretty good commercial fishery at one time in uh, state waters, uh, targeting these fish uh, as they would move in to spawn, and that went on for far too long. And um, effectively, we pretty much wiped them out um, in terms of our um, genetically identifiable uh, you know, distinct population segments. So, I, I guess I'm operating from a little bit of a sense of. <laughs> Of uh, having seen bad things happen when, and I don't, I don't uh, deny the, the attractiveness of the fish for commercial use and all, but I'm, I'm just a, a little afraid of applying too much pressure to it, uh, because if you, if you allow the, if you allow the, uh, the tack, you know, they'll certainly harvest it. Uh, it. It's a, it's a very marketable product, but just based on our experience and based on, and I know maybe. We were a little bit different in how the the fishery presented itself in um, uh, confined inshore waters, but I would argue that the, the Chesapeake Bay is certainly larger than uh, a lot of our sounds. But but uh, if you put enough boats and enough effort in there, you know you can exert some pressure. So I guess I I'm a, I would favor option B just from a standpoint of being more conservative with the fishery. Uh, Again, from our experience, and I know our experience is rather unique, uh, but um, you know we got to the point where we we no longer have our commercial fisheries, basically federal waters only at this point. So um, that that's my 
my thinking was was from a cons conservation standpoint of ensuring we have uh, a fishery 10 years from now is um, maybe not uh, over emphasizing the commercial side of it at this point. Thank you, Mel. Um, Spud, I believe you were on deck. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, um, Mel covered uh, a lot of what I was going to say. Uh, and uh, there, you know, there recently was an assessment of the Gulf Group Cobia, and uh, the results were not very encouraging. And as the state is sort of on the border with the east coast of Florida, we don't know what that's going to mean uh, for the southern end of the Atlantic um, Group Cobia. Plus, my, my biggest concern is that you know we, we are we're exceeding the existing commercial allocation routinely now, and not by a small percentage. And so, if we if we set it at seventy three thousand pounds, uh, is the expectation that we're actually going to end up catching 80, 90,000 pounds of fish? And ultimately, what will that mean for stock status? And ultimately, what will it mean when we when we have to revisit these allocations and make decisions about how to parse out this, this copious stock? Thank you. Thank you, Spud. I appreciate that insight. I, I guess um, based on that, I, I just wanted to add in for the board's edification, and Tony uh, can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, that the commercial fishery is um, still held. It's it's pretty tightly regulated at a two fish per person possession limit with a six, six fish per vessel cap. Um, and states certainly would be able to um, ratchet that down independently if they wanted to. So I just, just for the public and the board, I, I just wanted to um, make sure that everybody was aware that that those provisions were still in place. Um, and with that, so it, does anybody else have comment now on the substitute motion option B? Bill Gorham. Okay, Mr. Gorham, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah. To, to Mel's point, I mean, after Amendment 20B and resulting ACL, you know, that forced uh, North Carolina, really everybody, to take um, big measures in changing their fisheries, whether it's um, daily boat limits. Um, we did a size limit in an effort of hoping to get another year of spawning to increase the biomass. Um, and, and looking at the current um, allocations recreationally and numbers wise, it's, it's starting to look like we're going back into the same situation that's going to lead to more fish in the water. And in a bycatch fishery, um, there's gonna be more commercial catch. So it's, it's almost um, like we're, we're, one is gonna lead to the other and then we're restricting to restrict, um, we're gonna end up with a lot of dead, discarded, wasted fish. Um, so I just thought I would, would point that out. And... Okay, uh, thank you, Bill, appreciate that. Um, anybody else with comment to the substitute motion? No other comments, Lynn. Okay. Before would would people like a moment to caucus before we call the question? I see a hand this up. Okay. Let's do this. Let's take it's by my clock. It's two o five. Uh, let's try three minutes for caucus. We'll come back online at two o eight, and we'll try to um, call the question um, back through to the main motion. So, uh, three minutes, folks. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. So, does anybody need more time to caucus? I don't see any hands, Lynn. 
Okay, so with that, um, we're going to begin by calling the question on the substitute motion. Um, if it carries, it becomes the main motion. If it fails, uh, we go back to the main motion for option C. Um, and Tony, are we going to follow the same proceedings where folks raise their hand and you roll call? Yep. Okay. All right. So, um, all in favor of the substitute motion, option B, please raise your hand. I have Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Take your hands down. Okay. All opposed to the substitute motion, option B, please raise your hand. I have NOAA Fisheries, New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, and PRFC. Okay, do we have any null N U L L votes? Doesn't look like it. No null votes, Lynn. And abstentions. We have one, no, I'm sorry, two abstentions. Uh, that, and I'm sorry, <laughs> um, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Perfect. Um, okay, and are you're going to count those votes up, Tony? Or Savannah? I have, Savannah can check me. I have three in favor, seven against, uh, seven against, zero nulls, and two abstentions. That's what I have, Tony. Okay, so the substitute motion fails. Um, and now we return to the main motion, um, which is for the 96% recreational and 4% commercial allocation. And uh, does anybody have a need now to caucus on this before we, before we uh, call the question? Raise your hand if you do. No hands are raised. All right, and anybody have uh, some final words they wanna throw at this before we call the question? No hands are raised. Okay, let's call the question. If you are in favor of this motion, please uh, please raise your hand. I have no fisheries, South Carolina, New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, and PRFC. We'll take your hands down. Okay, and all opposed. I have Florida and Georgia. I will take your hands down. Okay, uh, null votes, N U L L? No null votes. And abstentions. I have U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and South Atlantic Council. Okay. So I have eight in favor, two against, zero nulls, and two abstentions. That's what I have as well. Okay. Terrific, thank you um, for the counting. So the motion carries and just, I'm gonna read it into the record. Um, it is for issue one, recreational and commercial allocation, move to approve option C, 96% recreational and 4% commercial allocation. It's a motion by Mr. Gary, second by Mr. Semino, and I very much appreciate uh, the discussion on that motion. Um, lots of good points all around and something for us to consider going forward um, with this board. 
so with that, I think we can move ourselves on to uh, issue two, um, which is the commercial trigger. Um, and it, are there any questions or commentary on this before we go to a motion? Your hands are raised. Okay, does anybody care to throw out a motion for issue two? Pat Gear. Pat Gear, go for it. Pat, you are self muted. We can't hear you, Pat. Still self muted, Pat. I mean, <laughs> there we go. It wouldn't let me unmute. My, yeah, I'm sorry. It wouldn't let me unmute myself, and I apologize. I, I move to approve option B, uh, the new commercial trigger recommendation by the technical committee. Thank you, Pat. Do we have a second? We have Mel Bell. Awesome. Thank you, Mel. So now we have a motion um, seconded. Is there any um, discussion on this motion? No hands are raised, Lynn. All right, we're just gonna roll through and um, call the question. Does If you need to caucus on this one, please raise your hand. There's no caucusing in Lynn since there was no discussion, you can, Maybe see if and if there's any opposition, and then we don't have to do a counting. Yep, you bet. Is there anybody opposed to opposed to this motion? I do not see any hands raised. Fantastic. This motion is approved by consent, and it is to approve option B, the new commercial trigger recommended by the technical committee. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for that. And now moving on to issue three, which is um, commercial de minimis. Um, and so we'll start again. Is there anybody who has uh, would like to provide comment to issue three? Okay, and so in that case, uh, is there anybody who would like to provide a motion for issue three, commercial de minimis? Joe Cimino. Okay, Joe, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I would like to make a motion um, <clears throat> for option F, which would be to allow 4% of the commercial quota or a 5,000 pound cap, whichever is less, be set aside and and not accessible to non de minimis states. Thank you. Great, thanks, Joe. Anybody with a second to this? We have Mel Bell and Maya. After um, five thousand pounds, can you add the word cap? Joe added that in his language. Great. Great, thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, Jeff, since you're the maker of the motion, is there anything further you want to say about this before we go to discussion? Yeah, thank you, Anastasia. Um, I, you know, for me, it, this is this is to address uh, those concerns with with having a closed fishery and discards for incidental takes in in, in many locations. Um, I don't know that five thousand pounds is the right number. Uh, in perpetuity, but I think for right now it's it's a good start. And since we, you know, had some concerns on on a on a growing commercial fishery, I think that this 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 particular cap right now is appropriate. So thanks. Thank you, Joe. I, and I, I I also just want to add. Um, I know we had um, 
heard uh, at the board that there are some more northerly states also who are um, considering declaring an interest in COBIA um, and that there will be discussion at the policy board upcoming to divide this board and so that COBIA would be split out. And, and so we could have um, a greater number of de minimis states um, in the mix in the not too distant future. Um, is there anybody else with comment on this motion? Chris Savage. Okay, Chris, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Maya, is it possible that you put the uh, table up that shows the options and what the uh, what the percent allocations? Yeah, that might be the table there. Yeah, okay. Um, so, it's two questions I have. Um, so, this option for the allocation we just we just chose. Um, the uh, the amount set aside for for this for for this would be two thousand nine hundred twenty five pounds. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. And, and second question. Um, I think with de minimis in the FMP, let's get my notes. Um, is uh, your state's commercial landings for two of the previous three years must be less than two percent of the coastwide commercial landings for the same time period? And then those commented at. Um, you know, some northern states have uh, uh, increased their landings in recent years. Um, you know, so in, you know, right, right now, you know, at the 2019 number, some of those states might not be uh, de minimis, but uh, they may have to fall back in. So um, I guess uh, maybe not a question to answer today, but I guess it's something we need to think about is, uh, is just how many states are going to qualify for de minimis in the future? Um, meaning that, you know, if some of these states are starting to ramp up their landings and they're going to be non-de minimis and i guess it's just whatever option we pick it just needs to be you know enough set aside for this commercial fishery which uh for de minimis commercial fisheries which you know i, I think is is probably probably needed but also enough for the uh for, for the for the non-de minimis states uh especially under you know a, a an overall commercial quota that, that that may or may not um be enough for the uh for the commercial fishery to stay open thanks Thank you, Chris. Anybody else with comments to the motion? Um, Lynn, I just wanted to um, add to what Chris Scott Savage had just said in that the way the board has set up de minimis for this species, it it is flexible in the way that responds to the dynamic nature of some of these catches that we are seeing because it is two out of the three years. So it does allow for a state or jurisdiction to have a very high year in one year, but still remain de minimis. Um, just to point that out to everybody. Um, but some of the landings that we are seeing in recent years for some jurisdictions are, are quite high and maybe pushing this 2,925 um, set aside when you add all the states together. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, I remember I remember that discussion when we set that up and we, we put a a lot of thought into it. Um okay. Anybody else with comment to the motion? Mel Bell. Go ahead, Mel. Thanks. I was just gonna say Joe touched on it, but basically this option kind of goes hand in glove in my mind with the first action or issue that we dealt with. So it kind of balances a little bit of that. Um, if, you're, if you are trying to be a little conservative, like I was. Okay, thanks, Mel. Anybody else? That's all in. Okay, so, uh, if anybody would like a moment to caucus on this, please raise your hand. There are two folks with their hands raised, Marty and Chris Scott Savage. Okay, so let's take, uh, let's try three minutes again. So we will, um, we will return at 2.25 to call the question. Happy caucusing.
Okay, everybody, if there's anybody uh, who needs more time to caucus, please raise your hand. There are no hands, Lynn. Okay, so in that case, we are um, ready to call the question and I, I'm just going to go ahead and read it again. So we know uh, for issue 3 commercial de minimis set aside move to approve option F to account for potential landings in de minimis states not tracked in season against the quota 4% of the commercial quota or 5,000 pounds cap, whichever is less would be set aside and not accessible to non de minimis states. Motion by Mr. Savino, second by Mr. Bell. Um, is there anybody who um, wants to throw final words at this? I see no hands raised. Okay, so if you are in favor of this motion, please raise your hand. I have Florida, South Atlantic Council, Georgia. South Carolina, New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, NOAA Fisheries, and PRFC. I want to make sure. In Florida. Oh, I said them already. Sorry. Yeah, you said them. One came in in the middle and it shifted everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <That's, laughs> if I didn't call your name, speak up, please. Okay. Whoever, all those opposed, please raise your hand. Your right hand. Well, uh, let me put everyone's hand down real quick, Lynn. Oh, sorry. There we go. Now we can have oppositions. We're ready. Okay. Opposition, raise your hand. I see no hands raised. Okay. Are there any null votes? N U L L? I see no hand raised. And how about abstentions? One abstention from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. All right. The motion, um, the motion carries. And so we now have a commercial de minimis set aside of 4% of the commercial quota or 5,000 pounds cap, whichever is less. Um, great. Thank you. One more. And this is the recreational de minimis question. Um, and I, I just want to uh, make sure that everybody's clear that with recreational de minimis, um, the, the, the choice the choice stands that uh, a de minimis state will be able to, to match a neighboring non de minimis state or choose from whichever size limit we're about to finalize. In other words, what I'm saying is you don't have to decide now whether you're going to match or take, take a one fish at this minimum size. We're just changing the minimum size. So with that, um, does anybody have comments uh, to this um, issue? See no hands raised, Lynn. Okay. Would anybody like to offer a motion? Pat Gear. Pat Gear, take it away. Pat, you're on mute again. Oh, we lost. We lost Pat. Um, I. I don't think I it just sent him the audio pin. Um, Pat, Pat, your What's pin it? number is 5403. I know he doesn't have the best phone connection, Lynn. I don't know. Mel Bell also had his hand up to make a motion. So, okay. Um, how do we want to do we want to? I'll sort of take advice on how to handle this. Do we want to give at a moment or go over to Mel. I'm back. Oh, oh hi, Mel. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what happened. It, 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 I had to put in my PIN number like multiple times. I don't know why it didn't work, and I apologize. That's the first time that ever happened. All right, so everybody can hear me, right? Loud and clear. Hello? 
Bob Cook, yeah. Yeah. for issue four, yeah. rec for, for issue four, recreational de minimis size limit, move to approve option C, a recreational de minimis state may choose to match the recreational management measures implemented by an adjacent non-de minimis state or the nearest non-de minimis state if none are adjacent, or limit, to, limit its recreational fishery to one fish per vessel per trip with a minimum size of 33 inch fork length or a total length equivalent of 37 inches. Seconded by, seconded by Mel Bell. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much, um, Mel. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? We have. Pat here with his hand up, as well as Chris Pat Savage and Mel Bell. Okay, Pat, do you want to comment on your motion? Yeah, I, I just think it's the reasonable thing to do since the other two options only allow for you know 33 and 60 percent of the the females are mature at those sizes. Uh, if you look at the spawning stock biomass from the stock assessment the last couple of years, it has been in decline. So it just seems that you know. We want to we want to get as many of the females you know, up to that up to the size where they're spawning. So this is a hundred percent. I think that's a, a a good a good choice to make. Great, thank you. And um, uh, Mel Bell, how about you? Yeah, that was my logic, and we would have landed on this one if I'd have gone before Pat. Uh, it basically gives you better spawning potential and opportunity for the females to spawn. And um, if you think about it, we've we went to 33 inches uh, years ago to, to try to facilitate that. Now, on the federal side, we're, we're still at 36, and we're at 36. So, I mean, that just makes sense to give them give an opportunity to, to get more spawn out of them. Excellent. Thank you for that insight. Uh, Chris Beth Savage, I have you on deck. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I support the motion and agree with uh, Pat and Mel's comments. Uh, in, in addition, um, you know, we've you know talked about you know the kind of the, the limiting factors uh, for the different commercial allocations. The recreational fishery may also be limited to, um, and you know, thinking about uh, you know, the, these fish becoming more available to de minimis states, and the fact that we you know, uh, monitor the, the recreational fishery and numbers of fish uh, going to 33 inches might maybe prevent. Um, you know, just the, the the de minimis harvest that we expect to see uh, north of Virginia in the coming years you know, to you know, push push us over the uh, recreational harvest limit, uh, especially with you know the high uncertainty in MRIP uh, estimates that that you see with pulse fisheries like Cobia, and especially in areas uh, that they're they're not very uh, they're not very common. So you, know, you just get one unlucky uh, MRIP estimate of a, of that had a 29 inch fish that that could result in some some pretty high and very uncertain harvest estimates. So 33 inches is probably the safer bet here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, good insight. Okay, any other comments on this motion? I don't see additional hands. Mal, I think your hand is up from before, correct? Yeah, I was correct. Okay, does anybody need to caucus on this motion? don't see any hands, Lynn. All right, let's do it. Let's call the question then. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. And I'm gonna say you could also try the no opposition way, but we got our hands up now, so I have, yeah. Uh, South Atlantic Council, Georgia, South Carolina, NOAA Fisheries, New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, and PFRC. PRSD, sorry, that was dyslexic. So we there for a second. Uh, that. Okay, when you, it sounds like we might be missing somebody in there. So um, when you have hands down, um, Tony, I'll move on. Hands are down. Okay, any opposed? No opposition. Okay, and how about null votes? 
No null votes. And abstentions. One abstention from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah, okay. All right. Very good. Uh, motion carries. Uh, the recreational uh, de minimis size limit um, to move to approve option C, where a de minimis state may choose to match the recreational management measures implemented by an adjacent non de minimis state or the nearest non de minimis state if none are adjacent, or limit its recreational fishery to one fish per vessel per trip with a minimum size of 33 inches fork length, and that's 37 inches total length. Um, and that uh, takes us to the end of our four issues. That was excellent discussion. I very much appreciate everybody's input. And Tony is going to talk to us a little bit about implementation. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so I think two things that I wanted to talk about in terms of implementation. Uh, so the board will need to decide when this um, addendum is effective. Um, so when it should be implemented by, um, I, and my suggestion, if it works for all the states, would be um, by January 1 of 2021 uh, in order to utilize the quota split allocation um, so that the states can set their measures for next year, if that can work for, for everyone. Um, and then once we decide that, then I can talk through, there are some states that need to make changes to their recreational fisheries. Um, I don't, I haven't done the math to determine how much of a reduction Virginia needs or how much of a increase North Carolina can have um, since we just, these new splits, but the TC has talked about a methodology for those two states to, to use and have um, approved the methodologies that they had come up with, knowing that we would have a short time frame between now and the beginning of next year in order to go through measures and approve those measures. So the now that we have a percent allocation split, those two states will go home and um, run the numbers and look at different management options for their states for the next year, and then bring something back to the commission to review and approve. And we need to determine if we wanna have a special in-person meeting to approve those new measures for those two states, or if the board wants to do an email vote to approve those measures. Um, and just to remind everybody, the for the recreational measures, we look, um, we do an evaluation every three years to see how the states are performing against the measures that they put in place. And Virginia saw that they were gonna need a reduction and North Carolina, North Carolina saw that they could have a small increase. So, Thanks, Tim. Just, so we'll need an implementation date here and then a decision on whether or not we want an in-person meeting or an email vote. Yeah, so taking this one at a time, do you need a motion for the implementation date or can we just do that by consensus? We can do that by consensus, that works for me. Um, and then in addition to that, Lynn, we'll need to do a final approval of the amendment an implementation date, either, either works. Okay, so it, is there any opposite, let me try it this way, is there any opposition to an implementation date of January 1, 2021? I don't see any hands raised, Lynn. Okay, so then I think by consent, uh, we can adopt that implementation date and then Tony for the, we need a motion to approve the whole addendum, right? With the implementation date. Yeah, or, we just a motion to approve the addendum as modified today. Okay. Is there anybody out there who would like to throw that out there?
Mel Bell has his hand up. Ah, uh, thank you, Mel. Go for it. <laughs> All right, Madam Chair, uh, I move to approve uh, Addendum One to Amendment One to the Interstate Fishery Management Plan for Atlantic Migratory Group Cobia for public. Oh, excuse me. Boom. Period. <laughs> as amended, as amended today. Perfect. Anybody have a second? Yeah, Pat Gear is your seconder. And okay. Maya, if you can say as amended today, and I'll add the additional language about amendment uh, to amendment one for the Atlantic Migratory Group when I can. And does it need, does it need to say to be implemented January one, or is that implicit in on the record? implicit on the record we're fine here then. okay good all right and so that that's uh the first order and then the next is we need to decide as a board um whether or not we want to meet and i assume it would be virtually we want to have a, a virtual board meeting to discuss uh uh changes for virginia and north carolina or are we comfortable doing that um by email and Tony, you said that that would be in November. It would either be late November or early December, depending on uh, the state's process. And this, and this okay. D does anybody have a strong, um, let's try it this way. Does anybody have a strong desire to meet um, in person, meeting uh, virtually over webinar? don't see any hands raised here, Lynn. And, okay. and I just will speak to the public that the TC has gone through this methodology and found the methodology sound for both states. Okay, that's good. Perfect. So now, is there any opposition uh, if we have an email vote on these two states' uh, regulatory changes? I see no hand raised in opposition. Okay. Uh, so everybody will be um, looking to their emails um, later on this fall, early winter, and um, we'll uh, we'll uh, uh, take a look at those uh, two states' plans. And then, Lynn, we just need to vote on this motion. Oh, yeah, we do, don't we? <laughs> uh, is there any opposition to the motion on the board? There is no hands raised. Excellent. That's good. I almost I almost just left it there and forgot about it. Great. Thank you. We have approved addendum one um, to the Atlantic uh, Cobia Fishery Management Plan. So thank you, everyone, um, for that. And I think Tony, that we get to move on to something completely different now, right? That's correct. And my, if you could just write motion carries without opposition, that would be great. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So um, I wonder. We are just two minutes ahead of um, ahead of schedule, and we may need those two minutes. But to, it's, I wonder if folks wanted to stand up and stretch. Sure, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Lynn, I failed to do this at the beginning of the meeting, um, but I just um, wanted to welcome Savannah Lewis, who is our new FMP coordinator for the South Atlantic Board Species. She is, um, this is her first meeting, full meeting with the commission as an ASMFP staff member. So just wanted to welcome her to the fun. Oh, thank you, Tony. And I should have done that as well. And I will just say that uh, I have worked with Savannah for um, a few years. She came from us at Maryland DNR. I'm not bitter. Um, she's fantastic to work with. So welcome, Savannah. <laughs> Thank you both. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so we are going now moving over to the cyanide portion of our agenda. And uh, with for that, we are going to um, get the updated 2020 traffic light analysis for our spot and Croker. And I think, um, uh, Don, you're going to kick us off, correct? I'll hand it over to you. No, 
It's actually Harry is going to start with Spot. Oh. I believe. Harry Rickabaugh. Okay. Take it away, Harry. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So this is going to be a, a tag team uh, presentation, as Lynn just kind of alluded to. I'll be going over the some uh, issues we had with the 2019 data when we went to analyze uh, the, this year's traffic light analysis for both species. Then I'll also go over the traffic light analysis for spot. Then I'll pass it off to Don, who will look through the um, traffic light analysis for Croker. And then finally, Savannah will go over the um, management responses needed for the uh, traffic light analysis for both species according to the most recent addendum. Um, you can go ahead and go on to the, the next slide, please. Um, I'm not sure. I'm seeing the outline. There we go. Thank you. So the first issue we had, the, the main one, would be that we did not have the NC values for CHESMAP for either species for 2019. The CHESMAP survey was completed in 2019, but the survey switched vessels and gear and comparison toes were made between the new and old vessels, but the gear calibration uh, factors were not completed in time for them to provide those indices for us this year. Uh, they will be available next year, so it's not a, a data point that we'll be missing you know, continually. We just don't have it at this point. Luckily, the missing values are not going to change the results of either TLA, as we'll discuss uh, as we move through these presentations. The second issue we had was with the FIMS trawl survey. We use that for a Croker juvenile index. The index will not be available for 2019. The FIMS uses the catch of an age one fish in the current year to, as a proxy for the recruitment in the previous year. This is the 2020 or 2020 survey. It was not completed. We will not have that value. Uh, that is supplementary information. That's not a, a triggering mechanism for that uh, for the Croker traffic light, uh, but it's just information that we use to help support you know our decisions. But we won't have that particular data point. And then we also looked at NEMAP. This is really a data uh, that's missing. We wanted to try to see if we had something to kind of fill in for CHESMAP. As I kind of alluded to, it didn't really turn out to be necessary, but um, and we are going to present that in these traffic light analysis presentations uh, as supplemental in material. We're not uh, saying we want to uh, substitute it for CHESMAP, but we are going to show it to you just to show how they how they compare. And then finally, um, not really relevant to this year, but we are going to have some more serious issues trying to complete the traffic light next year, as some surveys were not completed or only partially completed. Okay, next slide, please. Actually, you can go ahead and forward on to the next one. I'm not going to move on to spot. Um, so this will be the first year we're using the new updated traffic light analysis. As you recall, in addendum three that was approved this year, but we made some changes. This slide just highlights those changes. We incorporated indices from both CHESMAP and the North Carolina Department of Marine Fisheries Program 195. Uh, we revised the adult abundance indices using age length keys and lake composition information to ensure that all fish were age one plus to the best of our ability. And we also are now using uh, regional metrics, so it's split into two regions, a mid-Atlantic and a South Atlantic region, and that split occurred the Virginia North Carolina border. We needed to change the reference period uh, to 2002 through 2012 to allow for the incorporation of CHESMAP, which begins in 2002. And the triggering mechanism changed for spot to the terminal two out of the terminal three years needed to be above either of the 30% or 60% thresholds for both uh, the abundance and harvest metrics. And those thresholds did not change, they were 30 and 60% before. And uh, just moving forward throughout this presentation, 2017, 18, and 19 are the three terminal years. And also, just recall that um, even though we're using regional metrics, the stock is still managed as one unit stock. So if um, 
either region trips and requires management response, the management response is the entire coast, not just that specific region. Okay, next slide, please. So for all these traffic light presentations, you're gonna see these same sort of um, graphics. We've divided them by region. So this particular one is the spot harvest composite indices um, for the mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic region. This would be the commercial and recreational harvest combined. Uh, it's proportions of color. So the red being the one that we key in on as the triggering value. The two black lines correspond, the horizontal black lines, excuse me, correspond to the 30% and 60% thresholds. As you can see for the mid-Atlantic region, for the last five years, we're above the 30% threshold, including the two terminal years. For the South Atlantic region, three of the past four years, including the two terminal years, we're also above the 30% threshold. Next slide, please. And similarly, same graphic setup, but this is the adult abundance composite. So for the mid-Atlantic, that includes CHESMAP and a Northeast Fishery Science Center trial survey. And for the South Atlantic, it would be CMAP and the North Carolina Department of Marine Fisheries 195 survey. And again, this is only the adult component. You'll notice for the uh, Mid Atlantic, we do not have a 2019 value. The PC decided that um, including a single value would be the North Atlantic Fishery Science Service trial survey um, was not appropriate since it wasn't going to be a composite, it would be a single index. Um, it's also pretty obvious that the we've had been above that 30% threshold for several years now, including um, what would not be the two terminal years in this case, but 2017-18, which is two of the three terminal. We're still considering 2019, the terminal year, which is missing data point, but um, still 17 and 18, which were um, within that terminal three years, were above the 30% threshold. For the South Atlantic, uh, has not been above the 30% threshold. Uh, for about a decade now. Next slide, please. So those were the um, the two components that trigger management action within the addendum for the traffic light analysis. We also do some um, supplementary information. The first piece you're looking at here is the South Atlantic Shrimp Trawl Bycatch data. Um, the graph on the left is the effort for the fish trawl shrimp, the fish, shrimp trawl fishery. Excuse me, a little tongue tied there. Um, as you can see, it declined rapidly from the late 1990s through 2000, effort did, and it's kind of leveled off at a low to moderate level with some poor variable. Um, that is used along with the observer data in the most recent years and also CMAP data, which is used so we can back calculate the um, estimates for the years in which observer coverage did not exist. Uh, you can see that the effort value on the, again, on the left it's a little higher than it was in 2018 for the terminal year of 2019, but it is right within line of where it's been recently. Whereas the estimates of abundance currently for spot are approaching 300 million fish. Um, and that is an increase, I think it's higher than it has been since 1995. And that is due to increased observer, um, basically increased abundance within the observer program and within CMA. Okay, next slide, please. These are the juvenile composite indices. So the Mid-Atlantic region uses uh, CHESMAP and the Maryland Juvenile Sane Survey. Again, CHESMAP is missing, so there's not a 2019 data point. Um, I will say that the uh, Maryland Sane Survey was a little improved from 2017-18, but still was well below its long-term means. It still would be producing some sort of red um, within this graphic. And it has been obviously above the 60% threshold in the mid Atlantic region for some time now. Uh, conversely, in the southern region, it's actually improved the last few years. Um, the green yellow border within the traffic light is the long term means. You can see we're right now we're just above the long term mean in the South Atlantic for the past few years. And that traffic light is actually a single survey, the North Carolina Department of Marine Fisheries Program 195 survey. So recruitment's been a little different in the mid-Atlantic than it has in the South Atlantic. Um, it seems to be somewhat more improved in the South Atlantic and remains repressed in the mid-Atlantic. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we looked at NEMAP, um, 
this is just EMAP only. It's not a composite indice uh, index. And it has been above the 60% threshold for juveniles and adults for the past several years. One thing to note here is that this is a shorter time frame uh, survey and begins in 2007. Our current reference period is 2012, 2002 to 2012. And um, so for this one, we had to use a different reference period. It's basically the entire time series, 2007 through 19. Again, this was exploratory. So we, we, um, if we wanted to try to incorporate this, we'd have to try to figure out how to deal with the differing reference period. And particularly for program or system spot, we, we may not want to truncate the reference period for all surveys in 2007, which is what our current methodology requires all surveys to have the same reference period. So that's one thing if we want to include this in the future, we're going to have to deal with. Um, if you look at the adult uh, lower figure there, you can see that essentially, again, with the reference period being the entire time series, that abundance has declined basically pretty steadily from 2007 through about 2014, and this remained at a very low level you know, within that survey since. Um, so this kind of supports the Again, I guess I should mention that ChESMAP actually does track fairly well with EMAP. Those two surveys uh, trend with each other much more closely than they do with the Northeast Fishery Science Center or Trawl Survey. So one would suspect that ChESMAP probably is also going to be still in a similar uh, red proportion as it was in 2018 and 19. We won't know until we get the data point if that completely holds true. Next slide, please. So just to wrap up, the um, the harvest composite tripped to the 30% level in both the mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic regions. The adult abundance composite tripped at the 30% threshold in the mid-Atlantic, but not in the South Atlantic region. Since both the harvest abundance metrics tripped to the 30% level in the mid-Atlantic region, spot management, as outlined in Addendum 3, has been triggered to a spot. Uh, the inclusion of the missing 2019 data will not affect the trigger designation. It doesn't matter if that chess map is fully red or fully green and will remain within the 30% triggered level due to the 2017 and 18 values were at 30%. So we can't rise above that to the 60% or fall out of it and be untriggered. Um, uh, next slide, please. So with that, um, again, I had mentioned earlier that uh, Savannah will be going over what those management actions are that are now required to this being tripped after uh, Don presents the broker portion of this. So if you have any questions other than, I guess, the management part of it at this point, I'd be glad to answer them. Yeah, thank you so much, Harry. So what, what I would like to do is absolutely uh, just take a pause and take any questions on spot uh, for Harry, and then we'll move on um, to Dawn's presentation and deal with Kroger. So do we have any questions on um, the spot analyses? Go ahead, Spud. What? Well, didn't have my hand up. <laughs> so you did not have your hand up, Spud? No, ma'am, it's, it's showing it up, but I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how that happened, but. <laughs> you were just giving us a high five, Spud. That's all that was. Yeah, okay. Um, and does, is there anybody else out there with questions for Harry on spot? It's Bill Gorham. All right, Bill, take it away. Uh, if you go back to the landings graph, and could you explain how that's maybe it's harvest? Oh, too far. There we go. Okay, so what's your question? Basically, how this how this is calculated, or yes, sir. Can we yes, sir. Decide, so. so, so this these graphics are. Um, Essentially, what you do is you take for all the traffic light analysis. We use a reference period, which in this case is 2002 through 2012. The mean of that reference period is then used to you 
basically the confidence limits, the 95% confidence limits above and below, and you actually run a regression through that, and you can then calculate the proportion of red or, or green for each year for each park. In this case, you have two things in here, the recreational landings and the commercial landings. So you can see where you have red and green. If one of them is above its um, reference period average, it will be green. If the other one's below, it will be red. Essentially, that green, red, I'm sorry, the yellow, green border is the mean. So as soon as you go any little bit above your mean, your green, one confidence limit below is all yellow. So if you're basically when you're all yellow, you're basically at your mean. And then as soon as you start to incorporate some green or red, you're above or below your mean. Um, I'm not sure if that ex explains what what you your question or your yeah average. yeah it, it it makes a little better sense now. I'm I'm just looking at the red and thinking of. Does it encompass any environmental factors? No, these are strictly based, strictly based on harvest. So this would be the same thing with the, the all these indices are just based on the number straight from the index. Now, your juvenile indices, obviously, juvenile recruitment is highly uh, affected by environmental, environmental conditions. So you will see some. Indirectly, you may be seeing some environmental factors in there, but nothing's directly incorporated. Thank you. Any more questions for Harry on spot? I don't see any hand, other hands, Lynn. Okay, great. And Harry, thank you again for that. And um, Don, I think we'll go on and tackle Kroger. Sounds good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as Lynn said, I'm Don Franco. I work with Georgia DNR and I am the TC chair for Atlanta Kroger. So I'm just going to take you really quick through the traffic light analysis for Kroger. It's going to look really similar to what you just saw for spots. So forgive us if everything looks almost identical. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll start with a summary of the updates from Addendum 3 that was approved earlier this year. Seems like a million years ago, but it was only earlier this year. Um, so it's very similar to what Harry covered for SPOT with just a few small differences, such as in the first bullet point, we incorporated CHESMAP and then the South Carolina Trammel Net Survey instead of the P195 from North Carolina as the additional adult abundance survey. Um, the next three bullet points are pretty much identical to what Harry said. Uh, we use the revised adult abundance indices for the surveys, but um, one minor difference is we used adult, the uh, puppy adults at two years plus, not one year plus for Atlanta Kroger. Um, we still have the same regional metrics with the split at the Virginia and North Carolina border. And then we changed the survey reference time period from 1989 to 2012 over to 2002 to 2012. And then lastly, the trigger mechanism is slightly different. We changed it to if both the abundance and harvest exceed the 30% or 60% threshold for three out of the four terminal years. And so for SPA, it's two out of the three terminal years. For Kroger, it's three out of the four terminal years. Um, and say it's important to note the same thing that Harry said, that even though the regional metric is being used, the stock is still managed as one unit. So if both metrics trip in one region, and management response is triggered in the entire region. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we'll get into the traffic line analysis. This is the composite harvest, which is the recreational and commercial harvest combined. The Mid-Atlantic is at the top, and it has exceeded the 30% threshold for the sixth year in a row, with the past two years above the 60% threshold. The mean proportion red for the last three years, 2017 and 19, is 68%. And the South Atlantic has met or exceeded the 30% threshold for the seventh year in a row. And their mean proportion red from 2017 to 19 is 46%. But we have not quite went over that 60% threshold in the South Atlantic. Uh, next slide, please. 
And so this is the traffic line analysis for the adult abundance composite. At the very top, we have the Mid-Atlantic. And you'll notice that there is no 2019 data point because of the missing CHESMAP index. But um, same as with SPOT, even without that terminal year, the Mid-Atlantic adult composite has exceeded the 30% threshold from 2016 to 2018, the three out of the four. And actually, as far back as 2010, we have went over that 30% threshold. So we've met the trigger mechanism of exceeding that 30% for three out of four terminal years. And in contrast, the South Atlantic adult abundance has not exceeded the 30% trust threshold since 2010. Um, and just as a reminder about the surveys that are used for this adult composite index, for the Mid-Atlantic, we use CHESMAP and NEFSC. And then for the South Atlantic, we use the South Carolina Trammel Net data and CMAP, but just the adult. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is the shrimp, shrimp trawl discards for Croker. The left is identical to what we saw, of course, because it's effort um, for the, the South Atlantic shrimp trawl fishery. And as noted earlier, compared to the late 90s, uh, effort is much lower. Um, 2005 onward, maybe a slight increase from 2005 to the present. And then the graph to the right are the estimated croaker discards with increasing trends for croaker in recent years. Uh, with the 2019 data point being the second highest in the time series. And as a reminder, these are just supplementary information. They're not currently included in the trigger mechanism. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is also supplementary. This is the juvenile traffic light analysis, uh, which is not used in the trigger mechanism, but it is informative for us um, as a TC and, and you as a board. It's a similar trend as seen in the adult composites with more proportion of red in the mid-Atlantic than the South Atlantic. Uh, Mid-Atlantic has been over 30% for the past five years and over 60% in the last three. And South Atlantic is over 30% in 2015 and 2018, but below 30% for 2019. And again, we don't have 2019 for Mid-Atlantic because we use DIMS data for Mid-Atlantic. And as Harry explained earlier, we don't have the 2019 data point. It was just, well, or Chesnap. Yeah, so we use Chesnap and DIMS, so we didn't have anything um, to create that. And then for the South Atlantic, we use North Carolina P195 survey for the, the juvenile traffic light analysis. And next slide, please. And just like for SPOT, we have, uh, we, we looked at NEMAP for the traffic light analysis. We did, we discussed it, but we didn't incorporate it into the composite TLAs as of yet. And it, at same for SPOT, it corresponds really well with what we see in CHESMAP with um, declines recently exceeding the six, and see, uh, <laughs> Now I'm getting tongue tied, exceeding 60% in the last five years for juveniles, but for adults, it's only over 30% in the last three of the four years, where CHESMAP was over 60% since 2008 for that um, adult track line analysis. And in your board packets, you have a lot more information that you can see the adult and juvenile composites with the adjusted reference period needed to include NEMAP. Um, as Harry stated, it's 2007 and 2019. So if you were curious how it would look, you can go and look at those. Um, but spoiler alert, it doesn't change anything. We're, we're still over 30% threshold in all four terminal years for the Mid-Atlantic when using NEMA. And next slide, please. So in summary, the hardest composite trip that 30% for the Mid, Mid and South Atlantic. Um, so that's the recreational and commercial together. And then the abundance composite tripped at 30% for just the Mid-Atlantic. Since both metrics tripped for the Mid-Atlantic, management action has been triggered coastwide for all non-de minimis states. Um, and even with the CHESMAP 2019 data point missing, we still have three out of four terminal years over 30%. So uh, action is triggered regardless because 2016 to 2018 is over that threshold. And I believe that's all I have for you. If you go to the next slide, I'm happy to take any questions, but Savannah will cover management questions, but happy to answer anything else specifically about poker. Thank you, Don, very much. Well done. Um, do we have any questions for Dawn on her presentation for Croker? 
Chris Fat Savage. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Don and Harry, for the uh, for the presentations on track flight analysis. Uh, I guess this question could be relevant to both species, probably more for croaker. Um, the uh, shrimp trawl bycatch trends showed this relatively low effort in the shrimp trawl fishery, but increased croaker discards in the last few years, uh, while the South Atlantic uh, composite juvenile track flight uh, showed good year classes during that same time period. Uh, should we be looking at shrimp trawl bycatch trends alongside the juvenile abundance trends to see if they corroborate and determine to what degree um, the increased bycatch uh, should be a cause for concern. Just trying to get some context to uh, you know, the, uh, the supplemental uh, shrimp trawl bycatch information. Thanks. I can try and take a stab at that. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Um, well, it is it is actually informed by the juvenile indices, I believe. Um, will be used. Well, maybe it's not informed by the juvenile indices, but we did we did talk about that in the in the TC meeting earlier um, last month. And the reason for the increase there is because of both increase in the catch rates observed in the observer program, and also the increase in catch rates by CMAP in the last few years. So you, you kind of have to take these with a grain of salt and that they are an estimate. They're not a true number for exactly what the, the discards are coming, coming off of the shrimp trawl boats. It's our best estimate based on using CMAP as a supplementary to what we what little information we have from the shrimp trawl discards. If we had just straight shrimp trawl discards, um, if we had enough observer coverage that we could really have a handle on what those discards are, this data point might be might be very different. Um, but I, we, we think this is definitely an art the increase is an artifact of the increase in what we're the increase in the index for CMAP, if that's helpful. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, just quick follow up, please. Sure, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, thanks. No, that, that, that's helpful. And yeah, I know it's not, you know, I guess the direct um, uh, bycatch uh, estimate we would get in other fisheries with, you know, good observer coverage. But, but I think it's good context to put in the in these reports just so the, the public has a, 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 I guess, a better understanding of, of, of what these mean and, and, and the caveats. Uh, I mean, originally, I was thinking of this kind of similar to what we've seen with scup discards, uh, like in the squid trawl fishery, which you know, does raise concerns um, uh, when, when that occurs. But uh, when, when it has, it it's usually coincides with uh, some strong year classes of scup moving through the fishery. And it just seemed like when, when reviewing the, the information um, that uh, two of the, the stronger uh, juvenile abundance indices seen in the Pamlico Sound Trawl Survey, uh, Program 195, occurred right around the time the uh, the shrimp trawl discard um, or bycatch estimates uh, were also going up. So th thanks for that uh, explanation. Yeah, thank you, Don. I, I just want to add as chair that, you know, my hair did kind of stand straight up when I saw that croaker number. Um, so I agree with Chris, you know, that a, a little bit of context um, within the reports would be good. And it, it is challenging to explain to constituents, you know, how, um, you know, what the impacts of this very large um, bycatch are relative to the management we can do on the other fisheries. So as sort of a rhetorical comment, I thought I would add in. Are, are there any other questions for, for Dawn? We have Mel um, Bell followed by Josie Mino. Okay, Mel, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dawn and Harry. I, I think you may have answered my question, but it, it was related to the same thing, which was the nature of the discard data for both uh, spy and croaker. And uh, I, I'm sure Lynn's hair standing straight up was much more dramatic than mine, but that caught my attention as well. But I was curious about where that came from, if that was the uh, observer data or that was a, it sounded like it's uh, constructed from uh, maybe observer plus 
uh, CMAP and other things. Is is that right? This is Harry. Yes, just very similar to what Don said, but yes, it, it uses CMAP and observer data. Um, I don't know if Jeff Kip is on the call or not, but he is actually the one that ran these, and I, I asked him a question about it, and and it is a it's, it's both both the observer numbers, as far as I recall from the, the, the very small short discussion over email was um, both the observer coverage and the CMAP number were up, so they're both driving it up. So they actually, the observers did physically see more on the boats. Um, and kind of going back to how this relates, I guess previously, I don't know if you recall, but when we did the traffic light, we did try to incorporate this as a traffic light analysis. But within the TC, and, and I'm sure with everyone else that read it, it, it can be a little confusing because they are juvenile fish. So if you have a high discard number, that basically is going to occur usually during the largest year class in the absence of increased effort. Um, so is a large red number, I mean, obviously it's never great because you've, you've killed, in this case, the broker, but potentially 1.5 million juvenile broker. Or 1.5 billion, I'm sorry, juvenile cover. Um, but it also means they were there. So we had a, a better year class, but at the same time, how much is this discard mortality limiting the future benefit of that year class? And that's the piece we kind of don't know because we we don't really have a good way to try to estimate how many juvenile cover are there. Um, are there 10 billion? Are there 5 billion? You know, what proportion is that 1.5 billion? Um, that's kind of the piece of information we don't have. Yeah, and this is Jeff Kip, and I can just chime in here. What, what Harry said, I think, is completely accurate. Um, we have seen an increase in catch rates in both CMAP and the Observer program. So those two data sources are seeing similar trends. And as Harry pointed out, when you get a big uh, year class, it moves and becomes available to that shrimp trawl fishery, that's going to re uh, result in increased availability to that fishery and an increase in, in catches. So that's what we're seeing in the shrimp trawl discard estimates. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Harry. Um, Jeff Zanino, you were on deck. I, I was, Madam Chair. Thank you. And, you know, Harry's, Harry's follow-up there was perfect. It covered all my questions, but um, it, it doesn't cover all my concerns. You know, this morning we we saw the the southern block from from North Carolina south showing their uh, commitment to ERPs and multi species management for Menhaden. Um, you know, here this board continues to see struggles for rebuilding for several ASMC managed species, including spot croaker, weak fish. Um, you know, we've been dealing with these hair-raising shrimp bycatch estimates for, for quite a few years now as these trends have, have gone up. And, you know, I, I would just encourage, you know, anything that can be done, be done, including, you know, hopefully at some point better observer coverage if, if this is an artifact of that. But as, but as, as Harry pointed out, you know, when we do see a strong year class that hopefully can feed into, um, uh, better recruitment for the mid-Atlantic and then just gets wiped out. It's, it's really uh, disheartening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Joe. Uh, you know, I think this is something we need to um, keep our eye on. Are, are there any other questions uh, about Croker for Don? Chris Pat Savage. Okay, Chris, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just, just a just a follow up comment um, for for Joe and and just for the the board's uh, information. Um, the of course ASMFC doesn't manage shrimp. Uh, the states do, and, and North Carolina is currently uh, looking at uh, another amendment to the state shrimp fishery management plan uh, that's going to address uh, ma mainly mainly bycatch issues uh, in in the, in the sounds uh, and and mostly in, in estuarine waters. Uh, I know that's only a portion of where the uh, the Pinead, uh, shrimp fishery occurs, shrimp trawl fishery occurs. But uh, you know, just to I guess address uh, concerns I know many of us have about 
you know, the, the increasing trends in, in croaker and spot discards is uh, there, there are management measures uh, underway at the state level to uh, address some of these, uh, these longstanding issues. Thanks. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, anybody else with uh, questions or comments on Croker before we move on to management responses? Oh, we have if I could. Sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on what Chris said. Thank you so much. That is an excellent point that um, a lot of the struggles that we're seeing with Spot and Croker are not necessarily from the shrimp trawl fishery. They're from the smattering of all the fisheries. So. Hopefully, with uh, further regulations in place, we'll see some things changing. But if we could go back to the South Atlantic Juvenile Composite Index real quick, um, I'd just like to point out that in the South Atlantic, the Juvenile Index index and the Adult Index, there's a lot of green in those in those indices. And the shrimp trawl fishery that we're looking at is specifically in the South Atlantic. So I feel like if the shrimp trawl fishery was really having a huge effect. We would see it here in the South Atlantic juvenile or even the, the adult um, composites and we're and we're not. So I'm not sure if that alleviates anyone's fears or hair raising, but for me it's you know, it, it it makes a little bit more sense and doesn't send that, you know, that panic button off for me personally. It's mostly the mid Atlantic that we're seeing the extreme levels of red and that's not where our where these shrimp trawl boats are, are fishing. Yeah, thank you for that, Donna. You know, it that was on my mind as well as I was patting my hair back down. You know, it's it's an interesting um, it's an interesting phenomenon, and I, I, those uh, shrimp trawl discards are estimates. Um, but again, I think it's just something we need to continue to. Um, just look at as we go go forward. Just be cognizant of, of what's happening there. Um, any other questions, comments before we move on? Okay. Uh, Harry, Don, thank you so very much for those excellent presentations. And Savannah, I think we'll um, move on to you for management response. I just wanted to say thank you for a warm welcome, everyone. Um, and now I'm just going to walk through um, management responses outlined in addendum three. Okay, next slide. So before I get into the nitty gritty, I thought it would be really good to show you this table put together by our science team. Um, this shows various scenarios in which chest map data and EMAP data are used interchangeably. And as Dawn and Harry both mentioned, it doesn't matter which survey data is included in 2018 or 2019, you would still see the same trends, both um, for Croker and for SPOT. All right. Next slide. Oh, perfect. So what happened, uh, both SPOT and Croker exceeded the 30% threshold, triggering what's outlined as a moderate management response. And if you look at the table for both Atlantic Croker and SPOT, you're going to see that this requires a bag limit for fish, uh, up to 50 fish for non de minimis states. It's important to note that moderate management response is only going to, going to be required for states that are non de minimis. For the commercial side, uh, Atlantic Croker and SPOT uh, states need to take a 1% harvest reduction from the previous 10 year average. And again, this is for non, non de minimis states. States that already have regulations on the books are encouraged to keep the regulation. Um, when we hit that 60% threshold, which we will evaluate starting uh, moving forward, uh, then we'll worry about more intensive management uh, response. Commercial uh, needs to be a quantifiable measure and states can establish different measures by gear area as long as the measures implemented are quantifiable and projected to achieve the 1% reduction for the entire state's commercial harvest. So outlined in addendum three for spot and for croaker, measures must be in place for at least three years for Atlantic croaker and two years for spot. States, like I said, that have commercial regulations already in place are encouraged to keep them in place and the commercial measures must be evaluated by both the technical committee um, and the board to determine if they are quantifiable and meet the requirement of the addendum. And 
TC will continue to evaluate um, these fisheries using only the regional abundance composites from here on out because the harvest composites are going to be impacted by um, future regulations. Okay. Next slide, please. And so the next steps for the board to talk about today is uh, to discuss when these implementation plans will be due and what the timeline will be. Um, our recommendation was to consider this at the February meeting, um, but again, this is up to the board. Uh, addendum three is pretty tight in terms of what states are required to do. Uh, so if there are any additional questions on management and what needs to happen, I'll be happy to take those now. You can go to the next slide, Maya, if you'd like. All right, thank you, Savannah. Um, are there questions? for Savannah about management responses. Don't see any hands loaded. Oh, here we go, Bill Gorham. Okay, Mr. Gorham, take it away. Thank you. Um, we talked about this internally um, regarding our peer fisheries and received um, pretty strong public comment from a, a particular peer owner um, in regards to the um, participants in this fishery, um, the importance as a food source um, to the participants, um, and the major negative consequences um, to his business and as a food source to this, uh, which is called demographic. Um, and I, I promised I would um, say it on the record. And I guess I'm wondering, asking, hoping, um, is there anything that can be looked at to um, kind of alleviate those negative consequences on the fishery in North Carolina? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. I guess, you know, I, I would turn to Tony, but I, I think where we are now, you know, when we did addendum three, that was the time when we had those conversations. So I don't know what we can do now. I think those sorts of things would have to happen in a future management document. But again, I'll turn my virtual head over to Tony, see if she has anything else to say about that. Um, the only thing that I can think of that is a possibility is North Carolina as a state could ask for conservation equivalency to the measures, but you still would have to put in place a measure that gave, um, gave as much conservation as the triggers that are, or the change in the management measures that are in it. So there would still be a management response regardless. And then Tony, that conservation equivalency would need to go through the TCs. It, yeah, we'd have to follow the process that's outlined in the um, guidance document. Um, the state yeah. would have to make a request to the board it would go to the plan review team. The plan review team would send it to the appropriate committees, the TC, the AP, law enforcement committee, um, to evaluate the proposal and then provide a recommendation back to the board. And then the board would um, make that determination, the final approval or not. And then Lynn, Chris Bat-Savage also has his hand up as a FYI. Okay, uh, uh, Bill, are you good? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, Chris, that's added. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a question for Savannah on um, calculated to require commercial reductions, and you might have went through this and uh, missed it, and so I apologize. But just so I guess I'm clear, and I guess everyone else around the table is clear as far as calculating this. We just simply calculate what 1% of our state's 10-year average landings were and then develop management measures to reduce 
uh, our future landings by that amount. Like, so if it was, you know, 10,000 pounds and we wanted to do a season closure, we look at a time of the year in which the average landings were about 10,000 pounds and close the season, for instance, you know, would it be just, you know, simply a matter of that and, you know, of course, send it to the technical committee for, for their uh, review and approval? Tony, you can pop in here if I'm interpreting it incorrectly. Um, so the way that both the addendums have it outlined for both spot and croaker is that you have to reduce by 1% of the average state commercial harvest, um, either by season, trip limit, or size limit, um, or anything quantifiable. So I believe I, the way that you were outlining that makes sense to make that 1% reduction. You have to be able to show that you're reducing by the amount off your average. If that makes sense. Because I wasn't around for the initial calculation. So Tony you might have a little bit more insight into those conversations, but that is how I interpreted it. I believe you are correct, Savannah. Okay. As well. Okay, Chris, are you good with that? I am, thank you. And then Lynn, okay. you've Pat Geard? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, go ahead, Pat. Did we Lynn, lose him again? Yeah, I got a, um, his audio pin. I got to send it to him again. I think he has a bad connection, and so it disconnects him and then, like, reboots him, and so then he has to put his pin in. But Shanna has her hand up. Maybe she knows what question Pat is trying to ask. Maybe we can okay. her. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I unmuted. We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, the question uh, was about the timeline for implementation. Um, so it looks like um we're discussing maybe implementation plans going to the board in february um when would you want states to actually implement the changes by then we're just trying to you know figure things out with our regulatory process so i think and again tony may be the better person but i, I think what's going to happen is we're going to have implementation plans due in january for board review in February, and those implementation plans need to include um, your uh, most expeditious timeline, if you will, for getting these implemented. So, you know, the board can see, because everybody's regulatory process is different, it's going to take a different amount of time, and the hope would be that everybody has something on the ground um, in 2021, but that regulatory timeline needs to be included. Okay. Um, I might want to comment on that. I hate to step on Pat's toes. I'm not sure if he's back yet. Um, so for Virginia, we do want to make sure that we're including our fishery in this process. And we do want to take some time to sit down with our advisory committees um, and meet regarding um, how we want to take the commercial cuts as well as um, the we know what the bag limits are for uh, the recreational side of things but i do know that as far as a timeline is concerned we have our advisory committees meeting regarding covia right now um and so we were intending on being able to have our advisory committees meet hopefully in january but i'm not sure that we would be ready to submit an implementation plan in january just depending on when that timeline falls so just saying it's a little bit tight for Virginia regulatory wise um, for us to be able to get things in motion without, um, you know, without being able to talk to our industry first. Right. Uh, Tony, do you have any thoughts about that? Because I, I can try to help out Lynn. Um, I think that the board can have a discussion here today and come to an agreement of what everybody can do. Unfortunately, the addendum doesn't have a specific timeline, as I think Savannah mentioned. And so, you know, 
it is our assumption that it was to be in the next fishing year. We recognize, though, that um, turning something around in two, three months' time is very difficult for states to do so in following their administrative process. So if the board collectively wants to set an implementation timeline for this, then, you know, we can do that, and then everybody would be working towards the same date on the books. Um, and I don't, I don't know what other states um, regulatory impediments are outside of this, but it would be my hope that something could be on the books at least no later than the end of, you know, by the end of 2021, it would be great if we could get things on the books before 2020, you know, before the end of 2021, though. And then um, no. when I was speaking, I think Jim Estes' hand went up. I don't know if he still wants to speak or not. Jim? Jim Estes? Yep, I'm muted. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, actually, Tony, Tony answered the question I was going to ask. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good. So I guess what I'm wondering is it seems like one of the things I'm, I guess I'm wondering if we bumped up the deadline for the implementation plans to February. I'm wondering if there's a way for the board to approve those again over email or in some sort of virtual webinar so that sometime in February we all understand where everybody is in the process of their implementation. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's possible and if there's any state that cannot achieve that. Madam Chair, if I can just have a comment. Um, Please. So, and this is just a reminder that because it is a moderate management response, it's only states that are non-de minimis in commercial or recreational that have to implement these measures. So if your state you need to check, which we'll go over uh, at the end of this meeting, um, whether your state is de minimis or has requested de minimis status for your commercial or recreational um, co uh, croaker fisheries. Yeah, right. So that, I and I don't remember off the top of my head, you know, who all those are. I know that the state of Maryland has to act for spot, but not for croaker. Um, I'm still wondering for those non de minimis states like Virginia, that's under a really tight, for them it's difficult if this February um, implementation date would work. Because I think even though that, even though it's just the non de minimis states that need to act, the whole board needs to approve those plans, right? That is correct. correct. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. It has to go through the technical committees first before the board gets them. Right, which is why I'm wondering if the plans can be due in February to the TC. I hate to I hate to put board approval off all the way to spring because then I think it's, you know, I guess I would ask Virginia or any state if if the board approved implementation plans in May at the spring meeting, how quickly could you turn around and implement Put the regs on the ground from there. Pat here, and then Chris Pat Savage. Go ahead, Pat. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yeah, I, I, and I apologize. I don't know what's wrong with my phone. Every time I, I have to put in the code every time I want to speak. Um, yeah, we're in, we're in the process of looking at the regulations now. I mean, we have to we have to form them from scratch. We don't have any uh, regulations on spot and croaker, but um, you know, we can work on that. We we could possibly have it done by the spring. So I mean, it only takes us um, for a new regulation. It's going to probably it will take a little bit longer, probably sixty to ninety days to get everything completed. Okay, 
Chris, that's savage. Why don't you say what you were going to say and then I'll weigh in. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, hey, we, we can, we can, our, our administrative process is pretty fast. It's just getting you know, the time to you know, look, look at the information to determine what might be an appropriate season closure, for instance, for the uh, commercial fisheries um, and, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of input we get from uh, stakeholders in our state. So your, your idea of, you know, maybe pushing the implementation plans back till around February for the TC review and and then board approval, you know, sometime after that with things in place by the spring would work for us. Um, just kind of think thinking about this too, you know, for a state like us who, you know, is currently thinking about maybe a season closure for spot and croaker, you know, at times when the when the landings uh aren't aren't real high, you know, the, the longer we go into twenty twenty one without anything, the less options we have for putting in uh, season closures. Uh, and just the way the spot and croaker commercial fisheries are in North Carolina, they would probably have to happen at different times of the year um, if we go with the strategy of looking at, you know, when the landings tend to tail off and, and you know, take take the season closures in to, you know, avoid turning too many landings into discards. So, you know, this, this kind of my thoughts after, you know, listening to the discussions here over the last few minutes as far as particular timing. And on the recreational side, uh, it's 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 always better to implement new measures earlier in the fishing season than than during the middle of the season, uh, especially you know in the summer when you have a lot of folks from out of state uh, fishing along the coast. Uh, regulation changes tend to tend to not be very effective when they go into place. Then thanks. All right, thanks, Chris. Tony, what is the February the winter board meeting? Do you know the dates of that? I believe that it's actually the very last week of January this year. Bob, is oh. that correct? Am I remembering that correctly, Bob? No, it'll still be the first week of February. Just kidding. I lied. Sorry, Tim. Um, no, okay. when we, we, if, if need be, we, you know, obviously everybody's getting pretty good at webinars here. Um, we can do a special board meeting sometime, let's say in March, if that leaves enough time, we have the plans due in February and then the board can meet virtually to approve the plans for a quick meeting. I don't think it would take too, too long, so it wouldn't be um, too much of folks' time. It wouldn't be an all-day meeting or anything like that. So that is a possibility yeah. that we can do. Yeah, I think in order to make this work, and keep it equitable and make and and i really um <laughs> agree with what chris says that if you if you wait too long especially with the you know you, earlier in the season is better um so could we i think we're going to need to do something especially for this and i'm just wondering if we can make the plans due on the 15th of february if if two weeks is enough time for the TC, could we have a first week of March special board meeting to review the implementation plans, approve them, and then set everybody on their way? Does that sound reasonable to folks? It, if we, well, we can, if, as long as everybody turns in their plans on time, I think it's only fair. <laughs> the TC a couple, at least at least three or four days to review those plans once they've been turned in. Um, well, two weeks is what I was thinking. Two weeks, but then the, and then the TC would need to be able to write a report and then let you all have it in your hands for a couple of days as well. Yeah. So. So if they're okay, so if they're due February, if the plans are due February 15th and the board, we have a special meeting the second or third week of March. That's a month yeah. between the time we turn the implementation plans in and the time the board can approve them. Is that not, is that too fast still? Yeah, I think that that's fine, Lynn. So that would mean we would 
we would be approving these things mid March. And then as I understand from Virginia, Pat, did you say that it's, does that give you time in Virginia to do what you need to do? Or are you already out into May, eight May and June at that point? No, I, I think we'll, we'll be okay. It's just that it's um, the timing with Cobia and, and, you know, having to do this and get our, get our work group and our advisory committees together. But we're working on the regulation now. We can implement it. We could probably have this done by April. Okay. If we, with, if we go with the, you know, not having to do until the 15th. Okay. Okay. Is there, is there any state, non de minimis state that has to act that would have a problem with implementation plans? Do please on time, February 15th, and then a special board meeting in that March, Ides of March timeframe, March 15th. When you have Jim Estes with his hand up, and then you do have a member of the public that has his hand up as well. Okay, let's, uh, Jim, why don't you go ahead and then we'll go to the public. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman. So the time frame that you suggested for having the implementation plans ready. We don't have a problem with that. And I, I think you're very logical about, you know, taking a month to for the TC to look at these and then for us to get back together to approve them. Our slowdown is going to be in our administrative process. So if we do something that is somewhat controversial, I don't think that this will be, but I'm always surprised. Um, our next meet, our next commission meeting is in May. And we could have things actually on the books by June. If, however, there, I am surprised, like I usually am, and there's some controversy, we have to have two meetings. And so, therefore, we would not have our, our next meeting until July, which would mean implementation probably, I'm guessing, about the middle of September. If that's satisfactory, that's what we can do. And if it's not, I'm not certain what I could do to fix that, if that makes any sense to you. No, it, it makes perfect sense. And, and again, you know, I would defer to Tony and to the board, but I think, you know, the way these things work is that we're all bound, you know, by our administrative processes. And I, I think the, the, the crucial thing is, is that, uh, the, the board sees and we know that each state is set on a path. Um, and so if you're set on a path in Florida, I, I don't, I don't necessarily take issue with it, but I would, I would, um, you know, Tony, if you have any thoughts there, lay them on me. Lynn, I think you've described that perfectly. Typically in the past, the board, as long as the board can see a state is working towards implementing measures, um, there's not been an issue. And again, it's to the pleasure of the board. Okay, so let's hear from the public and then we'll try to wrap this piece, uh, tie a bow on this piece if we could. Thanks, Lynn. And the member of the public is Greg, is it Ludlum? And you just need to unmute yourself, Greg. Okay. Uh, Greg Ludlum, owner of CB Fishing Pier, North Topsail Beach, North Carolina. I sit here and I listen to a lot of this, a lot of it I agree with and a lot of it don't. A lot of things that are not taken into consideration, you take a 1% commercial cut and you cut 75% of the general public's cut, which is, you know, the way it goes. Uh, in my business, people don't realize that we service the handicapped, the ones that can't afford boats, the ones that can't afford to go to the fish market. My people eat what they catch. 75% of the people come every year for spots to cut them to 50 fish a day. And I, I took this up with Chris Pat Savage a while back and said at least 75. But I guess y'all got it chiseled in stone. Now I got to go back to the people that need this in their freezers. And these are the people that are fishing the piers that we have taken cuts and cuts and cuts at all the time with no help from anyone in the industry. Probably the largest fishing industry in North Carolina is the pier fish. I just wanted to put that out there and uh, let everybody know when they make these folks who they are really 
who they are really affecting. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. Um, we we appreciate we appreciate that. You know, these decisions are never taken lightly. Um, okay, so I guess at this point, um, what we'll do, I would propose. Um, this timeline of implementation plans being due on February, the middle of February, February 15th. I am not looking at a calendar, so I, I don't know what day of the week that is. It's a um, Monday and it's President's Day, Madam Chair. Okay. How about how about we take it to the Friday before that? That would be February 12th. Okay. And that way it's out of everybody's hair before Valentine's Day and President's Day. And then we will um, uh, convene the board, hopefully briefly, in the somewhere the Friday closest to March 15th um, to approve those plans and send us, um, send, send us all on our way. Thanks, Lynn. And we'll doodle poll everybody around that time to find the best um, date for a board meeting. Okay. And, and is there any opposition to that course of action? I see no hands, okay. Lynn. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for that. Um, all right. So I think with that, we are uh, at our final piece. We're almost home with 15 minutes to go. Um, Savannah, you're going to do um, compliance and FNP review, correct? Correct. All right. Take it away. All right. Let me get um, my screen set up here. Can everybody see? Let's see. Sorry, this is my first time running through this, so bear with me. Oh, no. Maya, if you just want to show it on your screen, would you mind? Oh, wait, I think I got it. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. Savannah, I can control the PowerPoint if you would prefer. Okay, I got it now, so we're good. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so today I'm gonna walk through, I'm gonna bring us home with three uh, different species. Uh, we've already heard a lot about cobia and Atlantic croaker, so I'm gonna be a little light on those. So if you do have additional questions at the end, please let me know. So I'm going to start off with Red Drum. Um, the plan review team met in September 2020. Total coastwide Red Drum landings in 2019 were approximately 4.8 million pounds. This represents a roughly 3.4 million pound decrease from 2018 and is below the previous 10 year average of 6.9 million pounds. The commercial fishery harvested about 1% with the recreational fishery harvesting 99% of the total. Coastwide commercial landings have varied um, and have been in 2019, they decreased to 58,000 pounds from 2018, where they were at 145,000 pounds. The majority of red drum commercial harvest comes from North Carolina. Red drum are assessed as two stocks, one in the mid-Atlantic from North Carolina North and the other in the South Atlantic from South Carolina South. In 2019, 80% of the total landings came from the South Atlantic region, where the fishery is exclusively recreational. The other 20% came from the Mid-Atlantic. This continues uh, the trend of the last 30 years, in which the majority of the harvest comes from the recreational fishery in the South Atlantic. Recreational harvest of red drum peaked in 1984 at 2.9 million fish, which the harvest is the blue bars here, uh, the yellow is the alive releases, and then the black line is the percentage of the harvest that was released. In 2019, recreational harvest decreased from 2.3 million fish 
uh, in 2018 down to 1.5 million fish in 2019. This 2019 harvest value is below the previous 10-year average for recreational harvest in numbers and in pounds. Florida anglers landed the largest share of the coastwide recreational harvest in numbers with about 40% of total recreational harvest, followed by South Carolina and Georgia. Anglers release far more red drum than they keep. The percent of the catch released has hovered around 80% since the 1990s. In 2019, 11.6 million fish were released, which is about 89% of the recreational catch. Uh, the most recent coastwide stock assessment was completed in 2017. This assessment indicated that the abundance of young, young fish from both the northern and southern stocks have remained fairly stable since 1991, and that SSPR has been above the overfishing threshold since 1995. Therefore, neither stock is likely experiencing overfishing at this time, but there is a great amount of uncertainty, uh, and Red Drum is beginning its next stock assessment. We have the data webinar coming up, so stay tuned for updates on that over the next couple of years. The PRT met um, and reviewed all the state compliance reports and put together the fishery management plan review. We found that all states have implemented the requirements of Amendment 2. They asked that the board consider approving state compliance reports and de minimis requests from New Jersey and Delaware. Additional research and monitoring recommendations can be found in the FMP review document. They remain unchanged from the previous year, but several of the um, recommendations are being evaluated in the stock assessment that is ongoing. In the table, it shows that New Jersey and Delaware both meet um, the percentage for de minimis. Red Drum doesn't really have a firm de minimis, but the PRT chose to evaluate individual states' contribution. Both qualify and both states have had de minimis in previous years. Now for the Atlantic Croker Fishery Management Plan Review. The plan review team met in October of 2020. In 2019, 4 million pounds total was landed for Atlantic Croker. This represents a 91% decline in total harvest since 2003, with which the harvest was 47.4 million pounds. There's been a 92% decline in commercial harvest and a 90% decline in recreational harvest. Respectively, commercial harvest makes up 53% of total landings, with recreational making up 46%. 2019 is the lowest data point in the time series. The majority of commercial landings come from North Carolina, followed by Virginia. This graph just shows the percent released. Um, so you have the blue bars representing the landings, the red bars represent the number released alive, and the black line represents the percent released alive. So recreational anglers released approximately 19.6 million fish, which is about 78% of the total catch. This is a slight increase from previous years. When the PRT met and reviewed all of the state compliance reports, they did find that all states have implemented requirements of Amendment 1. They asked that uh, the board consider approving the state compliance reports, as well as the de minimis requests for New Jersey for both their recreational and commercial fisheries, Delaware, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida for their commercial fisheries. In the table below, uh, it outlines any kind of um, sorry, and the table below outlines whether each state qualifies for the de minimis status in their recreational and commercial. Commercial and recreational de minimis criteria are based on a 1% total of the coastwide average 2017 through 2019 landings in each fishery. So New Jersey has a new request this year to be de minimis for both commercial and recreational and they do qualify. Delaware, South Carolina, and Georgia have all previously been de minimis and requested again this year for their commercial fisheries. Florida has previously been de minimis, um, and their commercial landings were slightly higher this year. So they got pushed over that 1% threshold, so they no longer qualify, but they do ask based on their prior de minimis status to get de minimis status again. And the PRT agreed to give Florida one additional year of de minimis status um, and revisit it next year. Additional research and monitoring recommendations found uh, in the SMP review document remain unchanged from previous years. And finally, I'm going to bring us home with Atlantic Cobia. 
the plan review team met in October of 2020. Um, so what you see here in this graph is harvest is represented in blue, red represents releases, and the black line represents the percent release. Recreational catch harvest and live releases. Um, recreational harvest was 97% of total landings, with 3% being commercial. Virginia has the majority of the commercial landings in 2019. And the commercial fishery, as we discussed earlier, was closed last year on September 4th because it was projected to meet the total annual catch limit. Virginia also had the highest proportion of recreational harvest with over 80% of total landings in pounds in number of fish. The PRT met and reviewed the state compliance reports and put together the FMP review. The PRT found that all states have implemented the requirements of Amendment 1. They asked that the board consider approving state compliance reports and the minimum status for the recreational and commercial fisheries in New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and for the commercial fishery in Georgia. All states do meet this requirement. We discussed um, earlier, it seems like a long time ago, but the de minimis status for COVID is you have to be, um, uh, your, your landings have to be under a percentage for two out of the three previous years because it is evaluated on a 3% or on a three year cycle. All of these states qualify for de minimis and all have had de minimis in the past. We did receive a last minute de minimis request from PRFC. They're requesting de minimis status for both of their COBIA fisheries. For their recreational, they do not have an inner investment because it's looped in with Maryland and Virginia. Their commercial fishery does qualify because two of the last three years are under the 2% of the total coastwide fisheries. They've had varying landings um, in the last four years, but overall they still do remain in de minimis and it was an oversight in their compliance report. So they asked that the board consider approving their de minimis status request. They like to make sure that their rec uh, commercial fishery isn't going to be just a fluke um, and they just want some more time to collect data. So with that, uh, the board actions, the PRT um, asked the board to consider approving all of the SMP reviews, all the state compliance reports, and all the de minimis requests. I put them here in uh, bullet points so that you can just check because it was three species, which states requested de minimis for which species. And I'll come back to this. Um, but with that, I'm happy to take any comments or questions uh, that you may have. All right, great job, Savannah. Um, any questions on this part of our um, agenda? Chris Fat Savage. Hey, Chris, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thanks, Savannah, for uh, walking us through the uh, compliance reports or the uh, the FMP reviews. Um, a question on Croker uh, regarding its de minimis status. So, if the state is granted the minimum status now, but in the next couple of years, uh, next year or two, um, no longer qualify for de minimis status because their their harvest and commercial landings go up. Would they be then required to implement the uh, reductions uh, put forward in, in Addendum 3? My understanding is that they will be. And de minimis is evaluated on an annual basis. So if we consider approving the state this year, it doesn't mean that the board will approve them the following year. And then they will okay. be required to um, enact everything from the addendum. All right, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's just wanted to make, make sure I understood that. Okay, that was my only question. And whenever you're ready, I, I have a motion. Okay, are there any other um, questions for Savannah? Don't see any hands raised, Lynn. All right, Chris, take it away. Thanks, Madam Chair. I move to approve the 2020 FMP reviews, state compliance reports, and the minimus requests for Red Drum, Atlantic Croker, and Atlantic Cobia. Maya, you can take over the screen and put that up if you would like. Hang on, I have a slide for it. Do okay, we have a second? Jim All right. Is there any uh, comment on the motion? And Lynn, just to um, put on the record, these are the de minimis requests, all of the de minimis requests that were in the compliance reports that Savannah reviewed. 
Yes, so it includes PRFC. Okay, just want to get that on the record. Yes, okay. And just so it includes PRFC, correct? Correct. Yes, okay. Um, good. And so again, are there any comments on the motion? Phil Langley. Oh, Phil, go ahead. Phil Langley, do you have a comment? Phil, you're no, no, I'm saying, no, <laughs> there we yeah, go. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, it was hit accidental. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to um, quickly just read the motion, move to approve the 2020 FNP review, state compliance reports, and de minimis requests for Red Drum, Atlantic Poker, Broker, and Atlantic Cobia. Uh, motion by Mr. Bat Savage, second by Mr. Estes. Is there any opposition to this motion? I don't see any hands, Lynn. All right, this motion carries by consent. And I think that leaves us with three minutes to spare to the end of our agenda, except we have other business. Is there any other business to come before the board? I don't see any hands, Lynn. Excellent. And is there any opposition for a motion to adjourn? All right, thank you everybody so very much for um, all of your great discussion and input. Really appreciate it. And I hope y'all have a great night and we get to see each other in person again soon. Thanks.